Yeah, we are live. Okay. So, welcome everybody and good evening and good morning. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, webinar on advances in spine surgery organized by Sancheti Hospital now on Ortho TV. And we look forward to listening to all the faculty. I'll go through the disclaimer first. Welcome to the online education <coughs> webinars. And we'd like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise, especially in these challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe day ahead. And we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on technology as well as internet speed, which might be an issue uh, at times. So please bear with us. So over to you, uh, Dr. Hargaukar, for, for the... Thank process. you, uh, Dr. Sham. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeraj and Auto TV for uh, a great support. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today, we are uh, here with you all for the webinar on advances in spine surgery. We all are, uh, uh, you know, we, as we all are struggling for getting better and better, advances are something which is keeping a good hope. We all are thinking about how we can give the best possible and safety approach to our patient in spine surgery. In your practice, we all are seeing that you, you, even if you are 5 years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years in practice, when the patient is coming to you, patient always thinks that, you know, okay, I, I am scared for getting for spine surgery. What can be the reason? Probably things which happened uh, so far and which, which will be happening because certain there is no answer to certain issues in spine. And that is the reason the technology is changing drastically and we are trying to get better and better, more precision and with uh, usefulness of this technology, like we are talking about OAM, navigation, neuromonitoring, we're talking about robotic surgery. All these things are coming and they're helping us to make it more safe. I will uh, introduce today's uh, premier faculty, uh, um, you all. Uh, we have ex extremely uh, talented Dr. Alok Sharan from New York. Dr. Sharan is known for his minimally invasive uh, so surgeries, awake fusions, what he's doing, as well as navigated and OAM assisted surgeries. Alok is also the Deputy Editor of Clinics in Spine Surgery and we welcome you Dr. Sharan for this uh, uh, Advances in Spine Surgery webinar. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Bharat Dave, one of the stalwarts in uh, spine surgery in India and who has shown the right way. He is uh, using OAM navigated surgeries for good some time uh, and his team in Ahmedabad and they are doing phenomenal work in advances and precision surgeries uh, today. They are doing a lot of complex surgeries in Ahmedabad and uh, we welcome you, Dave, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ajoy Shetty. We all know Dr. Ajoy is practicing at uh, Koimtur. Dr. Shetty is a thoroughly, uh, uh, he's a thorough academician and uh, a researcher and he is always adept with his uh, innovative ideas as well as technology and they, uh, Dr. Shetty is also using uh, technology for difficult and complex issues. They are using intraoperative CT scan and navigation. So we will be happy to see Dr. Ajoy's tips and tricks today for this advances webinar. Uh, our next uh, multi-talented uh, Dr. Ajoy, uh, Dr. Ajay Krishnan from Ahmedabad. Again, he's practicing at Stavya Hospital for spine surgery, and Dr. is doing extremely. Good work in complexities in spine. He is known for his difficult work in deformities, tumors, which we all will see today as well. And uh, his extreme uh, passion about technology also is giving us a lot of ideas for development of this uh, new technology. We welcome you, Dr. Krishnan, today. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Guru Raj uh, uh, from uh, Indian Spine Injury Center. Dr. Guru Raj is heading one of the units in Indian Spine uh, Injury Center, and he's extremely talented, renowned spine surgeon. We all know he's doing a great work with AO Spine India uh, as an education officer. Uh, at the same time, Dr. Guru Raj is well versed with uh, open surgeries as well as minimally access surgery, and nowadays they are doing robotic spine surgery. And long way to go, Dr. Guru Raj, we would like to see uh, what work you guys are doing at Indian Spine Injury Center with the robot and advances. At the same time, uh, I would like to uh, uh, 
yeah, talk about my colleagues, Dr. Ajay Kothari, uh, who is practicing at Sanjiti Hospital, and he is also doing phenomenally good work in degenerative spine deformities as well as uh, tumors in spine. And we welcome you, Ajay, to uh, see what current concepts he is going to talk about today, and will be sharing his uh, ideas today. And uh, last but not the least, Dr. Siddharth. Uh, Ayer, who is practicing at Pune, uh, and he will be talking about the evolution of spine uh, and advances today. Siddharth is a thorough academician as well as he's a, tru a truly talented spine surgeon, and he's practicing at Sanjiti Hospital, and he's looking forward for complexities in spine surgery. Thank you very much, all of you, and we would like to start with the introduction about the advances, and I would like to share the screen myself. I'm just sharing my uh, screen. Yeah, I hope it is there. Is it there, uh, my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today we will be uh, proceeding with the uh, advances and some basic facts I would like to enlighten in this talk, my, in my introductory talk, uh, where these are the days where we have seen in the 70s and 80s, we used to do the myelogram to identify the uh, spinal pathologies. And this is how we have moved on. And then we have seen the CT scan, the emergence, uh, emergence of uh, MRI and then PET scan and things like that. And now we are talking about the navigation, we are talking about the OAM and we are talking about the robotic surgery. We all know this is a very famous book by Dr. Atul Gawande. 97% of the time, if you come to the hospital, everything goes well. But 3% of the time, we have major complications. And this is everyone. You know, This is not a junior or a senior. But chances of having complications are less and less when you become a senior and expert. And there are more when you're younger. But this is where the technology will help us. And uh, the still station, navigation, and OAM is the future. Uh, where we are at least trying to aim at the accuracy, where we are doing the right precision surgeries. It is very important to understand that when we are talking about advances, you should have the basic concept. You should have understanding about the spine surgery, the anatomy, the science behind the spine. Because, you know, when you see some sometimes the screw which is misplaced and hitting the cord, you always think, what must have gone wrong? Is the surgeon is uh, not... Uh, doing it right or something is going wrong. So for minimizing this thing, yes, advances are the future. And this is where we are talking about. A lot of things like people talk about, oh, there is going to be a lot of radiation. But now with the newer versions coming up, there is significant reduction in the radiation, the precision, the accuracy, intraoperative scanning, like we are doing any tumor surgery, you can definitely check with the OAM and you can see how much tumor is removed, uh, how much tumor is remaining. This is the usefulness of OAM, and I would just like to talk about this one basic slide where we all know about the Tesla. If you see this, it, it is revolutionized uh, the concept of car and safety. These, these, the car which are like Tesla are like going like crazy. People want these kind of solutions because number one, if you see the driver is just sitting and it is navigated directly by the, uh, the uh, automatic uh, machinery in Tesla. If you see, you are seeing the object, you are seeing when to stop, you know, most of the things. And this is where the precision is coming. We are using cars. We are also driving cars. That does not mean that uh, Tesla is giving something, but it is giving more safety and more precision when we are doing. And this is going to be the future. This is going to, because 
we used to use nokia 3310 and today we all are using smartphones why because the precision the beauty of the phone lot of things we can do share and things like that that is where we always talk that we need to uh, understand why these advances why this precision why this technology situations like deformity cervical deformities revision surgeries prior fusions congenital malformations absent bony landmarks complex malformations difficult tumors scoliosis it's not that we cannot do this without technology with expertise with understanding yes you can do it but this is making the, uh, life more easier more safer in most of the difficult situations and this is what we we all should understand if you see this paper papers will talk about everything you know they will be uh, pros and cons about uh, technology but the minimal access surgery and uh, risk of misplaced screw if you see is reducing by day by the day and we have to understand it's not that we are using oarm or robot we need the cm at the same time you know it's not that they are going to be obsolete and we have to understand as i already spoken about that radiation exposure is one of the important thing which is getting lesser and lesser with the newer uh, advanced uh, oarm and uh, navigated uh, machines limitation of human joints if you see the hyperextension flexion and this is where we have limitation but when the technology will be there we will have 360 degrees movement with us minimally access surgery is going to be the future with less bleeding less issues intraoperatively and once we get uh, used to this we will start using it more often that is what uh, we always think about initially there will be a learning curve but once you start understanding then it becomes very very easy minimally uh, minimal scarring smaller incision shorter hospital stays less post operative pain faster recovery times in case of spinal cord fractures if we you check with the oarm yes we, are, we always check with the direct vision but when you have the oarm we can check intraoperative whether there is any residual part of the compression whether it needs to be taken out at the same time we can do that in tumors we can always check any residual tumor is remaining in deformities we can always be very precise when we are putting the screws in complex difficult scenarios all these things are going to be very very useful and these are the tumors you know sometimes we feel i couldn't remove the tumor completely and this is where this technology will help us uh, of uh, real time 3d high quality intraoperative imaging uh, uh, when we talk about oarm and navigation these are all the important salient features because they always keep the database with them and whenever you need you can use it immediately during and after at the same time robotic also is coming big time with uh, advantage a uh, lot of advantages uh, in uh, today's time this one uh, disadvantage if you think it's a costly uh, machine it's a costly investment technically demanding steep learning curve and increase operative time in initial days this is what is the experience of many who are using this uh, uh, now and uh, pre op planning this will already give you a good pre op planning and it will become very easy for most of you to use this straight away where you will not miss a uh, uh, most important you will not miss the accurate uh, placement of the pedicle screw uh, direction orientation all these things will be useful uh, will, will be used by the robot or the uh, oarm uh, and navigation basically the still station all these things uh, this is uh, what everyone will be covering today i will not go into the detail as dr gururaj will be talking about robotic uh, today and this is where we will be uh, looking forward this is what is the uh, most important thing where the execution you know with the experienced hand you can execute difficult situations in a very good uh, uh, outcomes and this is where the world is going to uh, towards it tomorrow we want to talk about safe spine surgery precision surgery and this is where i will uh, uh, cut short my uh, talk and would like to share with everyone's experience today i thank you all for being there and we'll start with uh, dr siddharth ayer to share his screen for the evolution of technology over to you siddharth yes in the meantime i just would like to ask dr bharat dave uh, sir how is your initial time when you started using the oarm i think the initial time was pretty smooth to be honest with you we did not have major hiccup uh, i'm going to cover that now siddharth screen is on so we'll just yes 
Yeah, yeah, sure. You're, you're mute. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hadgaukar for the introduction and this opportunity to speak at today's webinar, Dr. Ashok Sham on behalf of Ortho TV for organizing it. Uh, greetings to all the other panelists and all viewers everywhere around the world. So I'll briefly try and go through the history and evolution of navigation systems over the next five to seven minutes. So no disclosures and no conflict of interest. So in one slide, what is navigation? It's a computer assisted surgery. It's a technology that merges preoperative imaging with intraoperative imaging so that you can see unseen anatomy. All this helps is for you to 3D visualize in real time during surgery where the screw is going, how your instruments are going with, an if a, with the ultimate aim to improve the safety and accuracy. So if you look at the origin of uh, navigation, it probably is related to neurosurgery where you had stereotactic brain surgery. Frames were attached to the skull for deep-seated brain lesions. The difference between spine and brain here is between the skin and the skull, there's not any mobile unit and it's very close by. So in spine, it got more complex to begin with because there is considerable soft tissue between the skin and the bone and inherently the spine is more mobile. The need for navigation in spine, I think arose more after the segmental fixation techniques, uh, which we are now using practically everywhere from the pelvis all the way to the occiput. So navigation was required to help ease the insertion of such implants and to do them safely without harming any vital structures. So broadly speaking, navigation can be considered under two headings. One would be fluoroscopy based navigation, which had two dimensional navigation and three dimensional navigation. And the other would be considering it under CT based navigation and depending when you did the CT, it could be a preoperative CT based navigation or intraoperative. In the truest sense, there are five basic steps to navigation. You have to acquire an image. You have to plan your surgery. There is a process of registration of the patient inside the OR. Then you have a computer-based algorithm which connects the two, the imagation, uh, imaging acquisition acquired and uh, the registration performed. And then you go ahead and place your implants and guide implant placement with the algorithm that's generated. The two cornerstones in this are the image acquisition and registration. And based on how the image was acquired and how registration was performed, the evolution and history of navigation can be understood better because this evolution happened over the change of image acquisition and registration. So for practical purposes, it can be considered under three generations. First generation navigations were the first one which used preoperative CT scans. Uh, second generation navigation moved on to fluoroscopy based which had two dimensional and three dimensional imaging. And then eventually we have gone to a third generation where we are using either intraoperative CT, uh, of, uh, intraoperative CT based navigation. So this all started uh, somewhere in the mid 1990s in terms of spine navigation. I think uh, pioneers were, there were a couple of groups, one in France by Merlot. Uh, the paper was published with clinical orthopedics and research in 1998. And the other gentleman being Dr. Uh, Nolte in, uh, in the United States. So this first generation had imaging acquisition was through a preoperative CT. Uh, then registration was tedious because it was manual by surface marking and point matching. Uh, the supine CT was done preoperatively and the patient interop was prone. So there used to be some difficulty in change in position. And as you had to expose most of the spine to match each uh, of those five to eight points, uh, doing a minimal access surgery with first generation magnification was difficult. Additionally, any intraoperative movement would lead to loss of fidelity and the entire process of matching or registration might have to be repeated. If you look at the image, uh, you can see most of the handheld instruments with the light emitting diode to have actually cables that need to be attached to the computer. So it was that way tedious. And additionally, just have a look at what type of computer systems they were working at. They had a hard disk uh, memory of one GB and a random access memory of 64. Most common day phones have much more than this. So quickly through the workstation. So I get a preoperative imaging in the form of a CT. I plan which levels I would like to instrument. Once this is done on the intraoperative, quite often for one level, you would have to match between five to eight points 
once you had the matching done you would then move to a uh, patient registration if there was any loss in fidelity you would have had to rematch and re-register once patient registration was confirmed you would then perform a verification of accuracy and then proceed to give insert your implants and also you need to repeat all these steps for each level that you would instrument what changed with second generation was it was fluoroscopy based by now fluoroscopy was used uh, regularly in the operation theater in terms of biplanar imaging which would be uh, ap and lateral shoots uh, from this fluoroscopy we moved to image acquisition intraoperatively using the same fluoroscope the registration was automatic but the drawbacks were this was a two dimensional image the image that you finally did the navigation on was also poor quality siam images and uh, the advantage being that it was done intraoperatively so the patient position during the scan and when you were operating is the same so that was one advantage but eventually uh, the concerns were that the image quality was not as good as a siam so consider an example like this uh, this is the image of a lumbar spine lower segment so the white arrows show the reference electrode which uh, reference array which is probably uh, inserted over the in this case at the l2 spinous process but what you can see is practically only two or three spine segments so the field was view was quite restricted you could not consider operation on major spinal deformities because multiple such scans would have to be done and radiation exposure would come, would increase also because it was a, a siam image uh, patient habitus such as more obesity or even difficult to if you see regions of the spine such as cervical thoracic junction were difficult to use with second generation navigation of 2d fluoroscopy this would be an example of the final image that the navigation would have so you can see the image quality was not as good as you would expect what changed in the second generation somewhere was the development of a cone beam ct technology where the regular siam would move from 0 degrees to sometimes up to 180 degrees and shoot multiple x-ray shoots these would then be reformatted to give ct like images uh, though not conventional ct clear but at least much better than regular siam images so in this sense the image acquisition was through fluoroscopy which was again intra op but registration also was automatic Uh, the front runner of this was the iso c and its variants and thus was born the three dimensional fluoroscopy based imaging in which the additional axial component of the viewing was available during real time uh, intra op uh, navigation the image quality obviously was better than a 2d and also it was uh, considered better for obese or even complex complex regions such as cervical thoracic junction just a slide on cone beam ct so basically you would go from 0 to 180 degrees and take shoots so unlike biplanar which was 90 degrees or perpendicular to one another where you had an ap and lateral here you would go from 0 to 180 and multiple such images would be reformatted to get you something like this so this is what the iso c was based on it was a fluoroscopy based navigation but the final images appeared ct like the advantage was you could place the reference array through a minimal access portal on a particular landmark on the spine and as a result you were able to perform some minimal access surgery unlike generation 1 where you need to do manual matching and you need everything exposed from transverse process to transverse process on either side the drawbacks for this again because it is based on a siam the field of view when it goes through 0 to 8 180 degrees often can span maybe five cervical levels maybe three to four lumbar levels so again if you had a longer segment to fix you might need to repeat such scans as a, as a result increasing the radiation exposure and also need extra time for such scans finally we come to what is now current status we have the third generation uh, scans so here image acquisition uh, is intra op registration is automatic uh, the oam 2 that uh, was uh, that we are all using currently even dr bharat dave is using uh, is one step higher than the conventional 3d fluoroscopy in the sense it has a 360 degree rotation so the final images that you get are quite like ct and there there is very little difference than a conventional 32 slice ct that you would otherwise get maybe at any of your hospitals the flat panel detectors on the oam improve the scan view so you get 20 cm of vision so you get a larger uh, segment which you can scan and obviously the oam also has the additional advantage of image stacking where 20 and 20 could add up to 40 which generally means that you don't need to quite often read 
repeat a scan in case uh, you do have a long segment to instrument additionally modern day navigation have light emitting diodes over all the handheld instruments it can go from as simple as your ball probes to your sounds to the drills to your taps and as a result you can see the position of all your instruments not just the final screws that are placed and to complete what we have the the leading or the state of the art would be intra operative ct which is which is basically a portable ct scanner it it's not a 18 128 slice but it's a 32 slice scanner which is seen in the iro and the body tom this uh, this unit can be placed in the or it is quite often portable and can be moved from or to or uh, the only downside is obviously the cost uh, there are certain issues like separate tables is required because not a regular table will fit into the gantry of such uh, cities additionally uh, these uh, this intraoperative ct give you good soft tissue details so maybe of uh, usefulness to neurosurgery not particularly to uh, spine surgeons or orthopedic surgeons like us but yes it has some ad additional benefits so just the final slide a summary so point matching the big problem of preoperative ct uh, not possible to do minimal invasive which improved with the others but the problem was that there was imaging was lower quality in fluoroscopy it improved with the cone beam and to current state of the art is an intraoperative portable scanner which is uh, the current best available technology in terms of intraoperative navigation so thank you for your time i hope i have uh, i have i i'm hoping that i've covered everything quickly as possible and not making it too boring uh, in terms of a history lecture yeah yeah well well said siddha uh, you really covered nicely the evolution and uh, we will we, we wanted to know how it is come up and you know things like that we just want to know uh, what is the current status what is the future now you you already talked about evolution what they are thinking now how it will go in future what is your thinking because you must have gone through this i think the uh, in terms of literature what i have read is the next is brain suits where you have the the or is actually your mri machine and you work or you operate inside the mri machine i mean that is going to be the next level in okay. terms of having brain suits and mri suits and i don't know what okay. suits will have all right okay so that that's the very well said because uh, it's it's all going towards the accuracy precision and safety uh, over to you dr bharat dave uh, sir will be talking about his experiences with oam and navigation uh, yes bharat sir uh thank you very much uh, um dr parag sancheti and the sancheti team for uh, giving me opportunity particularly dr shailesh hargavkar because this is the second webinar which we are on now in last just few weeks um yeah. it is really you know um great opportunity to share the advances which we have adopted and i'm just going to share start with this uh, the dialogue precision is necessary when margin of error is small and this is very important particularly when we are in an area where you know it is very important where we have vertebral artery and spinal cord and the deformity is significant and you know the cord is just uh, not there basically you know it's all pretty uh, um, sort of compressed structure but it has its plasticity so that's why it is surviving so we should have real precision and where the error is small i just start with my lesson which i had in 2011 where i came across this gentleman of 84 year quite active without any morbid uh, uh, other disease and he was uh, trying to sort of uh, get some mangoes from the mango tree and he was he climbed there and then he fell and he uh, had all the following weakness and with bladder bowel symptoms and he had significant incoordination and quadruparesis when he visited us at that time his there is c1 c2 and his mr sort of c2 fracture with significant cord compression um 2011 so we operated but then probably he worsened post operative and maybe because of the vertebral artery injury and i did come across few complications and this was one of my worst complication which i usually share in order to just make sure that you know nobody should face this in future too so i am from the era like dr shailesh said earlier you know he is from the era of the ma uh, the uh, myelography and i am from the era of myelography too and uh, we did not have 
in a lead apron and one of my colleague he stole the lead apron and put it on the elbow guard and we used to really put it when we used to go to the operation theater and you know cover our private part in order not to get the radiation that was a scenario uh, in our uh, college days in our residency days so we all know you know hippocrates oath is not do not harm you know and that's what we all follow but at the same time with the technological advances we sh really should have do good and in this covid era further extension of this oath is that protect yourself first then your staff and then the patient so take care of the surrounding in the form of patient as well so this is something which i will be talking just touching on this covid era as well how we have sort of you know adopted technological advances so change is the only change which is constant and in order to just highlight the era which probably you know we have gone through our generation has gone through in the osteoporotic fracture the teriperitone has changed the practice completely same way for the fluorotic spine multi regional spinal stenosis which we call as nr mrss or tandem stenosis double level with the bone scalpel has changed the scenario same way this complex territories complex anatomy complex lesions complex regions like you know c71 that's where this oam navigation and neuro monitoring has completely changed the the treatment plans as well and that is what we call this as a integrated operation theater suits which are now going to be the probably future as mentioned by the previous speaker as well um so the stavya journey we used to sort of you know when we used to operate before this uh, era of neuro monitoring we used to say patient mode you know we will just telephone everybody or other telephone the person who is operating we have a team of five surgeon so somebody who is operating would say sir patient has moved so that's what you know the neurology has been maintained or normal and that then only we will have cup of tea that was the anxiety which we used to have we used to use lot of solimetrol as well because we were not sure you know whether we have sort of handled the cord properly or not and because of the neuro monitoring that has changed the practice too and we used to inform neurology after the patient is extubated and keeping the patient in neurology in the recovery room as well for few hours in order to just see and observe so that was a scenario of this severe many you know maybe about 10 years 5 7 year 10 years ago uh so the goal of surgery coming back to the real goal of the surgery after adequate decompression with reduction when necessary with implant fixation what should be the goal the goal should be implant radiation malposition so implant should be properly placed with minimum radiation and without malposition that should be the goal of a surgeon for the surgery and the optimum outcome and in order to deliver that what is most important is the workflow surgical workflow and that's what we can achieve with this integrated spine suit and that's what basically these are all neuro monitoring along with that the factory navigated tools that's what changes the practice completely because that's where it is really important because you know what you are doing you know, like that you are playing the game on the computer to be honest with you if you are aware of what the anatomy and what we have planned so what is important is we should have really class under ot and this is now you know very very important in this covid era we we usually have the neuro monitoring we have the drills which are all navigated and you can see you know where the drill tip is going so that is very important sometimes you intentionally bridge the medial cortex as well and you know you know that you know you are bridging the medial cortex in order to grip the proper uh, screw so the bone scalpel has also made the life easy and we have such two sets of the spine theater suits that's what may has made life really easy and i would say the learning curve i would say in opposite direction it isn't not it isn't that long you know you can do things much much better way and with the with the with the first few cases and you are on so that is very important we usually have the you know we have the operation theaters we can see from one theater to the second theater and the third theater so these are the things you know which really make us live as well you can see through and through what is happening in the other ot as well we have dedicated staff that is very important for this tools this is very important for this you know the technological advances because your staff should know what they are doing and that is very important because of the dedicated spine hospital i would say because we have only one sort of speciality so our staff knows what they are doing and this five teams per surgeons and our heartbeats are saved only because of this integrated spine suits because the surgical 
you know complexities which we are handling now you know we are able to really do it with more precision and still there are few permissible limitations which i will share as well so navigation enabling technology it is enviable i would say if somebody has a navigation you know it just superb you know you can do things much much better it is like camera when you use the camera you know you know what is the utility and when you have one you know you know what are the things that you can do with this so that is very important that you know once you have the navigation you can do you can use it in n number of cases and n number of indications as well when anatomy is taught but when the abnormal anatomy varied anatomy is handled in this on operation theater it becomes very difficult and when you can see that abnormal anatomy on the screen that's what makes life really easy and superb you know because then you know what you are doing and what you are dealing with when in uh, when the you know ankylosing cases things like that so ai uh, is on its way and i think that's what something we know or intelligence uh, artificial intelligence is going to be way ahead as well uh, as far as all the medical advances too so indications probably i would say indications for oam and navigation probably in all the cases to begin with because that's where you really want to get used to the thing then it is sparingly used initially used for all the cases then you can use it for mises deformity cervical posterior fixations tumors has been mentioned already by the first speaker you know that's where really it is important uh, i think the shell is also mentioned about the same redo surgeries redo fixation where you want to really put the, the ai screws you know goes into the sacrum and the ella high grade lysis and when there is abnormal anatomy when i mention about you know the particular ankylosing more cases where this has become a real blessing as well aims to achieve learning curve as i mentioned it is not as bad as one thinks about avoid duplicating the unwanted steps so you can really if you start working after few maybe you got 10 cases only you will avoid certain steps you know you will directly go zoom you are on achieve better pre operative planning if you really have planned it better like you know all of us surgeons they sit for few minutes with the with the mri and x ray and we plan it accordingly minimize the potential misplaced screws reduce the or time and i would say there is zero radiation our maximum user has been our devanand and his badge shows zero radiation so that is very very important you know because we all go out when the om should is taken just share as a surgeon if i walk and you know do not do we do not show few cases just to share with you this was been the anki case and it was like this you know the, the fracture had displaced and we were able to put this pedicle screws it was c6 to t1 and t2 you can see that you know this was possible only because of the oam and navigation so c5 to t2 screws we have put another case which was a doctor who had osteoblastoma you can see that case and that was navigated we removed the hole and mass and we were able to follow him up with good movement as well so this is something that you can achieve with this technology to another case hemi vertebra these are challenging cases you know the upper cervical hemi vertebra with arnold chiari malformation with the syrings with the lower uh, dl junction the scoliosis so congenital anomalies so all sorts of and where you can see that you know if you really want to do something there you are having an abnormal anatomy abnormal structures and that was possible only with this oam and navigation and that really has given age over the other this was recently operated just before the 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 lockdown started so february 20 another case to share quadruparesis and this was again c1 c2 you can see the odontoid invagination and to be honest with you if i share my own experience i was not comfortable and convenient and you know the, to do such complex surgery but now i'm able to do left right in and out and you know i'm able to put the position the the cages as well you can see that this was reduced and patient who did not have zero on the pre operative or the per operative when we started the surgery he did not have signals and post operative when we you know finish the job he probably had all the signals um, regained as well so this is something you know which you can really say is that good adequate decompression and that makes your life comfortable as well with the neuro monitoring too so those who use the oam they say there is increased accuracy there is complexity of the cases which really can be dealt with zero radiation exposure and performing the high volume of surgeries where it is very important because you do not want to bring your patient back again and that's again considered as a blemish too for both surgeon and patient as well and particularly minimally invasive surgery where it is very important but those who 
and it is a virtual imaging as you know probably you know the cervical has probably about a millimeter of the safety margin and in the lumbar probably 2 mm of safety margin because both are mobile in the dorsal probably you know one can say that there is good safety as well so because of the some movement occurring you can say that you know something you means basically you need to know anatomy proper anatomy you have to know so non users of this own they would say high cost they will say lack of adequate training i would differ there adequate equipment issues i would again differ there as well and there is learning curve again i would differ there as well because you know we have been able to adopt our most you know the 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 the, the guy who joined a year ago uh, was able to immediately adopt the technology too and disruption of the workflow i would say in the fact it the workflow is better with the oam and navigation so the concerns are which are usually said that surgical time is more i would say no surgical time is at the end of the day it is better it is sort of surgery the time is saved cost of necessary equipment yes that is where i would agree to con this concern necessary equipment they certainly are expensive but i repeat my staff our all overall you know this the the hospital staff they are able to manage it so well that that the cost has gone really down but yes if i have to share my experience about this particularly when you buy certain things like you know the oam navigation we were worried about the radiation because radiation is going to go around and that is where you know we ended up buying the glass between the two operation theater so that was also the radio opaque glass we had to buy another thing that was a challenge to take the machine into the operation theater that was also a challenge as well <laughs> Uh, yeah. but i think all those things can be overcome yeah. by uh, yeah i don't know it's a whole thing certain technical the, points like friend. 3d image uh, positioning very important um usually one spin is important for the six vertebra in the cervical and four vertebra for the lumbar and lower thoracic five to six vertebra for the dorsal spine so certain these are the technical points one really need to know but if you really have the long segment you can use the two frames as well i will cover that in a minute so technical limitations can be overcome by two frames and if the obese patient is there beware that c7 t1 junction may not be as good visible as the visibility you know the accuracy the anatomical landmarks may not be as good so if you are operating c7 t1 in an obese patient make sure that you are slow with your all the anatomical landmarks and you are you know doing this with the good precision as well so very important that obesity long distance frames yes sometimes you know you have to be closer to the frame in the recently we have been putting the frame without putting even the incision we have been sticking the frame on the what if onto the body of the patient and we stick we stitch it as well so you are not putting an extra incision as well so that's what we have you know sort of learned over the period of time and it gives equally good precision and safety too radiation to the patient that's always been a challenge but i'm sure you know for patient maybe one or two spins is not going to go give to bad radiation and as mentioned by shailesh as well all the machines which are coming with the low radiation too few conclusion from the papers they say that image guided surgery tools are associated spinal navigation i think it is good in the armamentarium of the spine surgeon which is something which is very good i was talking to somebody in the us and they say that you know in all the operation theater eight operation theater eight or eight navigation oh what a luxury i think probably all of our operation theaters are in near future maybe equipped with the same armamentarium as well image guided oam navigation cannot replace the technical expertise i think one really need to know this training of the spine surgeon it is very important that one has to really have the open surgery is performed first and then start the uh, this complex uh, equipments as well spine surgeons using this technology need to be aware of the pitfalls which i mentioned couple of pitfalls which i mentioned earlier so that is what should be kept in the mind so the experience of the stavia patient mood we really do not really need to talk about this usually patients are all comfortable because we have the neuro monitoring going on i do not remember now you know last few maybe couple of years we do not use solimedrol now and uh, we inform the neurology yes patient usually are well extubated and you know those all those four anxiety moments that has gone and our heart beats are saved as well with this newer and advanced technology too so this was a challenge this is the operation this is a you know, oam being rolled in and we had to open all the lift doors you know all the lift side panels and even the back panel as well in order to accommodate the 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 oam into the lift 
because you can't just lift it, you know, from the from the stair. And we had to have special arrangement made as well with the lift man. So that was a challenge, but it was fun. When we ended up, you know, putting the OAM on the first floor, and there was only one inch space, as you can see here, there, you know, at the top. So that that one inch space, which was very, you know, unique space, we had to really measure it again and again. We had to align the lift properly. And then we had to put it there up into the, on the first floor. Our operation theater is on the first floor. So again, precision is very important as the sort of the dialogue into the, into the flyer precision, very important. Safety certainly is important because the lift may fall and accuracy was again, one of those things, you know, where we had to really use. So Stavya journey experience has been technology, artificial intelligence, it's I think the way ahead. Junctional area, anatomical landmark, when you do not have, that's where we really need to, this will give us the edge over the other. Redo surgeries, staff education, very important. We have so far, with the two OAM, two suits, we have done about 1,050 cases till date. And about 80 upper cervical cases from 2004 till now. But the last 45 cases were just in last two years and without major mishap. So this is very, very important. These are the crystal clear data and these are all documented data as well. So OAM provides accuracy and safety. I would say at this artificial intelligence or the OAM enhances our abilities, but also it scales down our inabilities too, because there are cases where, you know, we are not able, we are unable to do certain things and that scales down the inabilities as well, which is very important. So it is too good to be lucky, but I would like to be precise so when the luck does not come in my way, I'm safe and I'm ready to roll. And that was Ernst Hemingway. So my sort of, you know, our friend Ketan, this talk goes to him. And we have been using, you know, sort of this OAM navigation and particularly this respiratory 100 filters for the COVID era. So I have put this COVID era safety, security and suraksa, which can be achieved with these theater suits. And now we have addition of this respirator with N100 filters. As you can see that, you know, this, this video can really, if it plays and probably maybe, you know, this is something that uh, is the respirator which we have used. We have done about 25 cases in last 15 days. 23 are with the fixation. And we have uh, always done the second spin because we do not want anybody to come back to the operation theater because the screw is misplaced. And we discharge the patient maybe early, but we admit the patient two days prior. We go for the COVID test, temperature testing, and the CT scan. And follow up on the phone regularly done every second, third day, because we do not want to miss any, any of these patients. I'm thankful to Parag Sancheti and Dr. Shailesh Hargavkar and Sancheti Institute for allowing me to share my opinion and giving this platform. Thank you very much. And uh, our prayers to you know for 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 all well-being thank you so thank you dr dave for an incredible talk it was a mind blowing um, amazing experience more than 1000 cases of oam navigation and we are very lucky to be here with you sir to live see what your experiences are and your team is doing um, uh, yes, as mentioned, Ketan is always there with us and we, we always miss him to uh, every core. Uh, our, our team always misses Ketan. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, being there. And uh, I just want to ask you two, three uh, questions which I had noted it down during your talk. What about uh, a lot of people talk whether you can use Indian implants because this is so costly and can you use Indian implants? Yeah. It can be used, Indian implant can be used very well. They have the third party navigation. And to be honest with you, you can be a little slow, but then once you have started using them, I'm sure, you know, after a few cases, you'll be comfortable as well. So indigenous implant can be used. That is, uh, we have not found a major fallacy in that as well. Okay, I just want to ask because uh, our, most of our colleagues, we talk about the ideology, you know, okay, I am doing it anyway without any uh, instrumentation. I am so used to it. My freehand technique is so good. I have done so difficult deformities, th things like that. How the ideology changes, you know, in this? Is yeah, it? I think. Going, I, yeah. I just wanted to ask whether yeah, it's like going from a manual car to automatic car. Yeah. No, I think I think your question is perfect and correct because that is something where you know 
patient, a person like Dr. Ajay Krishnan, who has 3D vision in his mind all the time, you know. So he would say, he, we used to share as well. And that is what he's going to cover in his talk too. So initial ideology was difficult to accept. But that is why I put that abilities and inabilities. You know, certain things you are able, but there are certain things you are not able. Like, you know, hemivertebra, like tumor cases. You know, that is where this challenge is there for us. And that is where, you know, you really do not want to fall back. That is one. Second thing, you do not want any of your patient to come back as well. So the second spin which we do with the OM gives you real perfection. And that is where I think we have the age over the other, those who have this technological advance in the OT. Uh, coming back to the same argument, if I can do it without, yes, we all know that one, you know, so many of us are trained to put the screws without OM, without IITV as well. But at the same time, there are challenges, there are redo surgeries, there are cases, and there are breaks. And we are coming with a paper as well that where we had found that this will house the, the six millimeter screw. And on table with the OM, we know that the pedicle size is only five millimeter. Or we know that, you know, there are cases where dorsal spine, there are cases where, you know, the, the six millimeter screw, screw we would have put and we would have blown the, the pedicle out. Or at the same time, particularly upper cervical cases where, you know, and we did not have the OM earlier and we used to put the screws in the C2 pedicle. And we know probably, you know, we may have damaged few as well. So that is what is a challenge as well. I think the way ahead with the medical legal issues, no, just forget about the medical legal issue, but not to do any harm. I think that's, that is what my answer is. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your excellent explanation as well. Uh, one thing which I wanted to ask you already covered is that open, sir, if you have very good understanding about open surgery, this becomes quite easy for you to change your practice and it's not difficult. Even you covered the point of the younger person coming to your unit, a fellow, and he also can get adapted in six months to one year time. So they were very good learning tips for us. Yes. Shailesh, I want to ask one question to Dr. Yes. Dr. Uh, sir, in which cases you won't use OAM? Um, I would say practically all the cases I would use the OAM because, because, you know, probably, but yes, somewhere I feel that, you know, this patient is, well, I, I think I would, I would use OAM in any, all the cases. There is, there is nothing that tells me when not to use. I, I, I don't see any case where I do not want to use the OAM. Uh, ex, yes, you can say pregnancy probably, where you, where you really would refrain using the, the radiation. And the next question is, sir, how do you make this technology cost effective in your practice? Uh, what are uh, the factors which makes it cost effective? Well, first thing which I, that is why I mentioned about the technical staff, you know, the our staff, because maintenance practically has still been zero. We are using it since two years. So maintenance has been still zero. We have adopted our own way, you know, how to use the OAM, how to cover the, the patient, the operating area. So they are not that difficult. You know, you can just cover the, with the, with the towel so that that will stop, you know, using the, the, the OAM cover. So because that OAM cover is difficult, tedious to put on as well. And each time you use disposable, maybe 2000 rupees, maybe 2500 rupees. So that is where, Probably we have cut down certain things. We use the, the towels and then you can re-autoclave them. So each time we cover the towel and then you we fold it and then we put it back again. So that is, these are the things. Yes, at the same time, the cost wise, I think probably I would put it in my pocket. The the only answer for from my pocket is we, at this severe, we do not charge extra cost for the OAM. We say only one thing that the overall outcome has given more work. It has brought in more work. And that is where we have got the age over the others. I would say, you know, a lot of complex cases are coming. That is what I mentioned. That is a 45 cases in last two years of C1, C2, which was like, you know, it was a dream that, you know, we, we have, we have, we operated these 45 cases without any mishap. So cost cutting is probably something where we have not considered extra charge being paid we added only 7,000 rupees per package. That was about, you know, from if, if it was 1.5, it made to 1.57. So 7,000 rupees for the disposable. And that covered practically, you know, all of our running cost as well. Thank Great. you, sir. Thank you for uh, a brief talk. And uh, we would like to move on to uh, Dr. Alok Sharan. Uh, uh, Alok, hi. Hi, how are you? Yes, you, you would like to share, yeah, 
Yeah, please share, share your screen and your, thank you. Okay, good. Can you see me now? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lish, for um, this uh, invitation uh, over the ocean. It's, it's great to see. And um, my, my intention was to give this talk towards the end. And I, what I wanted to do was uh, talk about advances in um, uh, spine surgery as it relates to both navigation and robots and tell you about some of, some of the um, projects that people are, are working on here in the United States and how we're integrating all these new technologies and what it's, uh, what it's leading to. And, you know, there's obviously there's tremendous um, improvements going on with both the navigation as well as the robots. And it's really exciting to see how spine surgery has evolved um, very significantly because of both these navigations and because, because of these technologies. Um, and as, as Shalesh has mentioned early on, that my focus um, currently is on uh, awake spinal fusion, which is, of course, a um, minimally invasive approach to doing outpatient uh, spinal fusions. But I bring up this point because I want to I want to always emphasize um, it's important to understand what the goal is. What are we trying to achieve? Um, we can get really caught up on talking about the benefits of this technology and that technology. But I think ultimately, at the end, if the patient is in the middle, it's important to remember, remember that still spine surgery needs to be made uh, safer. Um, it certainly needs to be made more cost effective. And then ultimately it's gotta be a good experience. All of us believe in the benefit of spine surgery, but I think it's important to always remember what the goal is because in the United States and in uh, India as well, the population is aging, right? And as it is clear that there's gonna be a greater demand for spine surgery overall, now, if there's gonna be more people getting spine surgery, we have to be sensitive to the cost of spine surgery. And I think that that's something that I'm a little, little bit worried about as we introduce new technology. If the new technology is raising the costs but not, inc not improving the quality, I'm not sure if that's a good direction to go. But then ultimately, it's also important to remember that the goal is to get a good outcome. And I think there's still tremendous variability in outcomes. And um, a lot of there are a lot of reasons why there's variability in outcomes, but I think it all starts with the proper diagnosis. And that if you have the incorrect diagnosis, it doesn't make a difference what technology you use, you're gonna have the wrong surgical procedure. And so the question is, what are some of the issues that right now that we're dealing with? Of course, there's still tremendous medical issues involved in doing spine surgery. And of course, there are issues involved with just surgery itself. And a lot of the focus of this presentation is regarding the, uh, instrumentation. Um, but again, I want to incorporate all this because it's going to be relevant to what I speak about in a few minutes, which is that we should, we have to really, really be careful that we correctly identify who needs the spine surgery and get them in to see the specialists as much as possible. And I think what's so exciting to me is that as we integrate navigation and robots, these new advances, we're going to be able to use data, big data, machine learning, and that ultimately is going to help drive outcomes, which I think is, it's important to remember that this is the goal. So in terms of advances in spine surgery, um, at, at the very immediate stage right now, the focus for the companies that are involved in robots is more, first of all, more most importantly, the precise placement of instrumentation. And then ultimately the goal is going to be to be able to put in a pediatric cervical pedicle screw with minimal complication. That is gonna be the gold standard that we have to sort of aim towards. And as we become better with instrumentation, there's a lot of work being done now on using the robots to just begin um, doing proper decompressions. Right now, a lot of the focus is in the tumor world, but ultimately there's no reason why a robot can't be involved in just doing a simple laminectomy. Um, there's been some focus, Globus in particular has been looking at this role of the robot doing a T-lift. And what they're looking at is how can they get the robot to do an accurate facetectomy and discectomy with proper imaging so that you can insert a cage and there's a lot of focus and research being performed at that level. And then ultimately, um, if once you get the decompression aspect of it down and the haptics of navigation and robots become better, then you'll start being able to do more accurate osteotomy. So beyond just instrumentation, this is, this is where sort of the next generation of companies are looking at with robots. But I think what's interesting is sort of what is the future now? What, what actually is, what is going on and where, where, this, where is there a lot of collaboration going on? You know, what's, what's nice is that we have um, incredible companies like Johnson & Johnson, which is working with uh, Google, and you have companies like DaVinci, which has been working on 
their robot for a while and they're starting to partner with like, micro, I think Microsoft. And what's gonna be interesting to see is what these collaborations lead to. At a very high level, there's three, level, there's three things that they're working on in terms of the future. One is the development of independent workstations for spine surgery. Two is the ability to perform robotic surgery virtually. And then three is this notion of uh, remote proctoring. So we know that, for example, with the, the Da Vinci at this point now, with prostate surgery, kidney surgery, the surgeon doesn't need to scrub in. And the accuracy of those kind of surgical procedures is very high. So there's a lot of focus right now on in spine surgery, moving um, ultimately moving away from the surgeon having to scrub in. Because once we get to this point, and it's not too far away, what's going to be nice is the ability to do surgery virtually. Uh, during the COVID pandemic in the United States, and I'm sure in India, telehealth and remote care has just exponentially increased. And so beyond just being able to give a diagnosis clinically, there's a lot of focus right now on uh, doing remote surgery. This is a company called uh, Corindus. Uh, about two years ago now, they did uh, telerobotic surgery for vascular procedures. This is a patient who was having a vascular procedure. Uh, the doctor was in Massachusetts and the surgery was being performed in uh, San Francisco. I think it's about 28 patients. And they did something similar in uh, New York as well. And they compared the outcomes clinically from an independent um, uh, doctor. And they found that the outcomes in both San Francisco and New York were equivalent. So they showed from a proof of concept perspective that telerobotic surgery can be done across the country. The bandwidth is very good. And there's no question that this can be done um, across the world as well. Um, India is not too far away because India is already doing something like this. Um, I believe better than in um, Ahmedabad is a cardiologist. Yeah. You may know him that is a cardiologist who performed uh, telerobotic surgery uh, 32 kilometers away, and and that worked out really well. But the notion is not new. In uh, in 2001, there was a surgeon in uh, who in uh, there was a, a surgeon in New York who performed a laparoscopic colostectomy in a patient in France. That was 19 years ago. So what, what's interesting is that, that that's something that um, Johnson & Johnson is working on very closely with, a, with a Google. And the hope is that ultimately um, the, the surgeon anywhere in the world can perform surgery on a patient really anywhere in the world. And that's been a major focus now for the second generation of uh, navigation and uh, robotic technology. The one I'm also really excited about is this whole notion of uh, proctoring. So there's a lot of surgical procedures. I'm always amazed at the 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 surgical, the surgical skills of um, surgeons in India. And, it, and I think in the US, we would benefit from the greater collaboration. So I think a lot of times during surgery, when a surgeon is um, in a complicated part of the procedure, if they don't have a senior attending who they work with, they often have to work through it. And now there's a lot of work being done where another surgeon can view their surgery by using glasses or some type of uh, video and what's gonna what can happen now is that surgeon in a, from a remote location can walk that surgeon through and help them get them through um, that procedure or perhaps even show them a short video. So there's a company called uh, In Touch Health. They originally started with just typical telemedicine platforms, and now what they have set up now and I forgot which company they're working with, but while you're doing surgery, um, they they can have a video displayed. Um, of what surgical step you're on. And they can basically display on the top left-hand side, you can see a virtual image of how to get through it so that if you're in a remote location and you don't have access <clears throat> to a senior surgeon, now they have the ability to sort of understand where you are in the procedure, perhaps play a video or, or pop open a virtual image. And, and that will help you, uh, walk you through um, uh, how to get through that procedure. So this is actually really exciting. Um, this company is doing very well and this, this technology will be coming out um, to the market fairly soon. And then finally, to my point about um, developing, develop, uh, delivering good outcomes, ultimately there's gonna be a need for integration of all these technologies, robots, navigation, telemedicine. Um, there'll be a time now, and this is not too far away, where an MRI image will be uploaded to a computer and the computer will understand that the patient has spinal stenosis at L45 the patient will upload their pain levels and data will be able to be correlated to that, um, to that patient. And then eventually the computer will be able to sort of look at the patient's profile, spit out um, what the patient needs, and then essentially instruct the robot 
with the assistance of a surgeon, hopefully, on what kind of procedure can be done. This is the focus right now between the J&J &J collaboration and Google. They call it a digital surgery program where they're trying to basically have mechanisms to collect data off of imaging and patient symptoms and have a computer sort of pro process this all together and determine what, what surgical treatment is gonna to lead to the best outcomes. And with AI and machine learning, I, this is not too far away, but I wanted to just give you a sense of the focus of where things are right now. So that was hopefully just a good overview for you. And hopefully this was helpful to just give you a sense of where, where the second generation work is being done now in this, in this um, field. Thank you. Thank you, Alok, for covering uh, uh, the most of the spectrum about the advances. And uh, I, we only asked uh, Dr. Sharon to talk about what's happening in US current. Uh, that was the only idea as he's associated with the clinics in spine surgery and the spine also the uh, and, uh, NAS. Uh, we just thought of just uh, checking what's happening out there. And thank you for a beautiful uh, explanation of uh, the technology, what's happening. Any questions to Alok? I think, uh, Alok, excellent presentation, Ajay here. Uh, I think uh, the way we are heading, I think the surgeons will be obsolete in some time then. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point and it's something that's brought up right now. I, surgeons won't be obsolete, but you'll be having more of a supervisory role. So that instead of doing one-to-one -one surgery, you'll be in a situation where you'll be doing one to three surgeries, one to four, and you'll be supervising younger surgeons doing surgery. So what it'll do is give you the ability to operate on someone in Africa, India, and Europe at the same time. Yeah, just, just to, uh, to ask you, Alok, if there is a problem or complication while the robot is doing the surgery, um, how to deal with it? Yeah, that's ultimately the question. And so even with the Da Vinci- It will take a, it yeah. will take a long time for uh, only robot good. to do the surgery. Yeah. For sure. And that's why there's always going to still be a need. Hopefully before, until I, until I retire, there'll always be a need for a surgeon. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> It's going to be a long way, long way before that happens. I have one more question, Ajay. I just want to know, because most of these are, are radiation-based. Is there any progress towards non-radiation-based imaging, uh, which might guide through the process using ultrasound-based technologies for us to make it much more uh, safer? Yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really interesting question. Something I'm very interested in. Uh, you know that when I do my awake uh, procedures, we do that T lip block T L I P, and that's an ultrasound based block. And so, um, actually, I put that question to Globus uh, if they can integrate ultrasound technology instead of radiation. And so, it's something that we're actively exploring right now. It can be done. It's just not. It hasn't been their focus. But the technology is there already. Okay. I, look, can I ask a question? Uh, you are very much for awake fusions. So if you're doing a awake fusion surgery with OAM and navigation, if at all the patient moves a bit, so does yeah. the patient and everything changes or uh, does it still remain the same? How about, how is your experience with patient moving intraoperatively? Yeah, so that's that's a very good point. And of course, that's that's that could be a limitation of the awake surgery. Um, you know, with awake surgery, there's two ways you can do the spinal. You can do a spinal or you can do an epidural. When you do a spinal, you get a motor block. When you do an epidural, you don't. So what's nice is that if you do a spinal block, you minimize the chance of that patient moving. So if your goal is to use a robot, you'd be more, you'd want to consider doing a spinal versus an epidural. So you get that motor block and you minimize that patient moving. But that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Alok. As we all know, Alok is uh, doing a lot of awake uh, surgeries, uh, awake fusions and uh, revisions also in uh, awake uh, surgery. So that's a long way for uh, all this technology to add up to awake fusions and probably looking forward for a great work from you, Alok, in future. Uh, I would like... Uh, one thing, yes. one thing, one thing sorry, please, and one thing I want to tell you just before you go, when as things open up in India, I should I encourage all of you to consider the awake procedure because you can avoid the intubation. I have a colleague in Italy who's doing awake x lifts, and he recently did an awake x lift uh, L1 to L5 procedure. What's nice is that they avoided the intubation. And in this post-COVID era, I think it's something that in India you should consider strongly. All right. Ajay, sir, yeah. Ajay, sir, with your vast experience, your experience or your thoughts about awake fusion, even Dr. Bharat. Yeah, definitely, yes. I think we are going to move into it very... Uh, 
slowly over a period of time. See, for example, lysosomal uh, rupiocaine is still not available in India, and certain drugs are necessary. I think it should be a possibility soon. The necessity of COVID probably makes us adopt it much faster. Um, I would I would give the different comment because the patient coughs in operation theater, then also it will spread everything. So I would go in the other direction. Let's have the patient intubated, well packed, and then operate. Because then you know we wait for 20 minutes pre-induction and post-induction uh, before the procedure we start. So probably you know that will give us less contamination. But yeah, yes, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, it, it's a possibility and both ways, uh, as uh, Dr. Ajoy is saying and Bharat sir. Thank you, Alok, for an excellent presentation. We move Thanks, on uh, as our advances. Uh, I would like Dr. Ajoy Prasad Shetty to share his tips and tricks as he is doing this um, navigation and intraoperative CT for good some time. Over to you, Ajoy. Uh, thank you, Sailesh, and thanks all of you. Uh, basically, I imagine it's a very small talk of... Uh, probably five minutes on the tips and tricks of using navigation. I mean, uh, you heard so far that navigation can be used, I mean, uh, to direct a pedicle screw and to, in and to plan and execute, to execute a safe pedicle screw uh, insertion. Wherever it may be, in case of complex deformity, it helps us to plan an outside in technique of screw placement. You can use uh, pre-registered screws also, but basically in our center, very rarely we use we use the navigation to track, to formulate our trajectory, but then we use our uh, screws mainly freehand. Uh, navigation then moved after the insertion of uh, planning and executing a screw. It could be uh, also safely used in uh, MIS. And uh, most importantly, it can be used in planning and execution of a tumor resection however small it may be as in a situation like an osteoarthritis or a quite a big tumor to know the exact location of the tumor you can identify the tumor and you can use uh, navigation to plan and execute, execute your tumor per se we have been using navigation also to plan an osteotomy to be sure that you have excised uh, the adequate amount of wedge for you to achieve an adequate uh, correction it can also be um, used, I mean, technology is now being available to plan your lordosis of the screw intraoperatively by using various systems. But however, navigation with an error is much more dangerous than a non navigated surgery. We have to remember that. Therefore, there are various tips and trips which we need to follow while you are doing a navigation surgery. I mean, uh, it could be divided into four regions the tips after exposure and fixation of the DRA tips during registration and accuracy check, tips to prevent motion artifact, and tips to maintain the accuracy during the procedure. It's important that you should have all uh, access to all type of uh, attachments to the navigation devices, uh, the registration devices, and it's important that you have all of them as a part of an armamentarium. Uh, therefore, after exposure, the first part is the fixation of the DRA, or the, uh, uh, the refraction array. The plan is to, you have to always assess the steps when navigation will be needed and when it is not needed. Adequate wide exposure is necessary if you are planning to do an open surgery so that there is a space for you to fix the DRA. And uh, it varies between open and MIS. MIS also is necessary that you are fixed in a part where it is relatively stable. And you have to, usually it's fixed on the spinous process, which is the relatively more stable part. But you can have problems if you are doing it in a child or sometimes when the, in the revision surgery where you may not be able to fix it to the spinous process. As you can see, it's also important that there is no blood stains over the reflectors. And if there is a blood stain, see your uh, image uh, might be quite good. Uh, it's very, very important to have a stable fixation of the uh, DRA or the minimally invasive reflective array. Either it could be on the spinous process, or if you are doing a MIS procedure or a lumbar fusion, you can also use it over the uh, iliac crest. People are used uh, fixing the mirror over the Mayfield clamp, which is not advocated by the company, it's an out of usage, but still we have used it sometimes, found it to be quite adequate. 
if you have in a revision surgery, what happens is the fact that if you are doing an extensive revision surgery, you find that there is no spinous process left. You have done a fusion in a scoliosis or an adult scoliosis where you need to do the revision. What you can do is you can use two of the previous screws and put a rod and attach the mirror over the rod so that you can use that as a firm fixation point. You can navigate all around. You can introduce your screws, plan your osteotomies. Uh, quite adequately, or in this case, a tumor that has recurred uh, after five years and which needed a proper planning for uh, removal of the tumor. Where to fix the mirror? The question is, you can fix it in the end if provided your incision is quite shorter. But if you are doing it for a long segment, it's always better to fix it in the center so that uh, it doesn't interfere with the fixation of your screws proximally and distally. Otherwise, you need to re register many times. Therefore, you have to plan exactly depending on the length of your incision when you're doing open surgery as to where you need to fix your uh, mirror. Tip during registration and accuracy check. During scanning is better that the patient is in a non-ventilation mode to avoid artifacts. Keep the, and post scanning is always better to keep the tidal volume at the minimum possible. You always do accuracy check at multiple known landmarks. Some initially it could be near the mirror and also see the maximum extent where you are exposed. And you can check your accuracy check. What I mean to say that if you pl place your pointer over the spinous process, a known anatomical landmark, you have to be sure that that's what is reflected on the screen. As you can see, this is how it is shown. You place your pointer on the tip of the spinous process and here, and that is uh, displayed properly on the screen. It is also important to periodically check your accuracy, especially if you are doing a long segment fixations. And how to prevent motion related inaccuracies. One of the biggest problems is when you are doing a manual tapping and screw insertion, there is an wobble effect which can cause inaccuracies while you are passing your screws. Therefore, it's always better to use powered instruments like burr and drills to make your pilot hole. And what we usually do nowadays uh, to prevent the inaccuracy is the fact is that especially those screws which are near the fixation of the mirror, what we usually do is to we create the pilot holes and uh, we plan to put the screws only at the later part of the surgery so that the screw insertion will not cause any uh, inaccuracy in the other, other areas where you are planning your screws. It's important to maintain the line of sight all the time. And you can understand that by this is the UV reader where you can adjust it in different direction if your line of sight is not okay. It's also important that any alteration in the DRA can result in inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the surgical team, all the members should be aware of it. If you have a new member joining you during the particular procedure, sometimes when they're moving the instruments or they're handing over the instruments, they can move the instrument. And if you think like that, if you're sure that it is moved, and there is an inaccuracy, it's better to re-register. And when in doubt, always check with the fluoroscopy. See, this is a scenario wherein you are placing it over the lamina, and you find that the tip is just underneath the lamina. That means to say, this the registration has been lost, there is a movement, and this is inaccurate. Therefore, ideally, when you are placing over here, you should see like that. When you're placing over the lamina, it should be the tip should be seen on the lamina. But if you find the tip to be inside, even underneath the lamina, you find there is some sort of inaccuracy and you have to be careful. And this happens uh, quite often whenever there is a mobile segment, sometimes in the cervical spine, or sometimes when your assistant might touch the instrument. Therefore, it's always better when you're doing a long segment to re-verify it every now and then. Therefore, to conclude, when in doubt, always check with the image intensifier, verify, use it often. The team becomes comfortable over a period of time and is actually very, very easy. And especially for those who have done an open procedure for quite long time, when you know the anatomical landmark of your entry of your pedicle screw, using a navigation just makes it a subcortical level and takes off the stress of the surgeon. It makes your surgery much more pleasurable as uh, Bharat said. It helps you to do something which you are hesitant to do. And it's important that advances this technology is ongoing. I know it's expensive, but it's important for us to adopt soon so that we become proficient in the usage of the technology. Thank you. 
Sailesh, so. Can I, can I ask a question, sir? Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, in a high surgical volume hospital like yours or Dr. Bharat Dave's, uh, so my question is, in such scenarios, would you use OAM for only select cases like complex even C2s or complex deformities? Or would you promote using for a single level fusion, which are quite straightforward cases? So what's your thought? First, Ajay sir and then Bharat sir. Uh, no, but in our center, we are not using it for all the cases because it's the mobile, it's a arrow city is kept in one theater wherein the space is adequate. And we operate in three theaters like Bharat, we don't have the second one. And uh, we use it basically for complex cases. You asked me the question, is it worthwhile using it in a single level fusions? Yeah, given a choice. Think, I definitely think it's worthwhile because if you operate thousand single level fusions, you realize that there is a good percentage of them where it is a malposition of the screw and they can have a post-op radiculopathy. Is okay. it absolutely essential? If you've done an open procedure, maybe not. You can feel across the medial wall of the pedicle and be sure that you are not breached. But if you are done at some area where the part where the, where the pedicle or the inside anatomy is not seen, it's always it's a safer if you are able to rescan it. I'm slightly worried about rescanning because of the fact of the radiation. Yeah. Not for me, but for the patient. patient. Therefore, you have to consider the age of the patient before you rescan very often. Because if you think of a scoliosis patient who has been operated, and you think that how many years in her life she needs to take radiographs and things like that. What I do nowadays when I'm operating a scoliosis is the fact that I start putting the screws, and if it's free for me, I keep on put all the screws, and in the end, if I feel it's necessary, I scan it. So that they limit the number of radi uh, amount of radiation to the child. Okay. Bharat. Speaker, speaker, speaker. Sir, you're a speaker. Uh, Bharat, sir. Yeah. 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 For, the, for the single level, probably we do not always insist on using it. Like uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Ajoy said. But for the complex cases, yes, we always use it. And we usually build the sort of two surgeon team. So that you know, both the both the surgeons they are they are doing on one side. So usually we are not using it for single level. But yes, for complex cases, we make sure that you know we allot the case in the OT where the OM is there. Yes, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah, certain things I would just like to add, like uh, to teach a conventional surgery. Like we said, 10 to 15 years back, not a lot number of surgeons were doing spine surgeries. But now the number of surgeons are increasing and they are better surgeons. But at the same time, the better surgeons, they are because of the volume they are seeing and the numbers they are seeing. But at the same time, what you see, now the even papers are available, teaching a conventional surgery it will take more longer than teaching a uh, computer assisted surgery. There are good enough number of papers which very clearly says that it is easy to learn a uh, artificial intelligence based surgery. So that is something for high volume center, what uh, uh, Kothari asked, for them it is even more easy that you can very well train your juniors and even the residents and expect a better return out of them. At the same time, what Dr. Saran said, that you will uh, get a supervisory role and to jump into complications which you end up creating if at all. So that is the one thing which I want to add. For certain tricks and trips, what Ajay sir has already covered, uh, always put the critical things first. See, what is in the literature very clear that every seventh to ninth screw, what you are putting, the error increases roughly. So, if your first or second or third screw is the most critical screw, if you are starting from the concave side, you are likely to get lesser problems. So, that's all. The, the DRA, what you are fixing, its liver arm should be very near to the body. The more nearer to the body, lesser is the error. So that is a very good thing which is there and repeated verification as sir already told. Awake uh, 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 surgery though Saran says that it is the future but I have attempted to do it in transformal endoscopy also. Patient just moves and you lose everything. So it's not going to be as of now visible. There has to be more to it. There may be other ways to circumvent it. We need to uh, think about it and uh, 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 say uh, uh, th th this is the main important thing which is needed for those critical things to be done. Yeah, well, 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 well said, yeah. uh, Ajay. 
Uh, yeah. Dar, you wanted yeah. to ask something, yeah. Yeah, Please. just last thing to add. In this COVID era, you know, we probably would spin all the patients before we roll them out. So that is very important. Probably, you know, in this COVID era, we have to really do that so that we do not bring the patient back. Okay. Yes, Siddharth. Siddharth, unmute. Unmute, please. One question. One question to uh, uh, all the senior members here. So I, I did read some literature which said that, you know, you're going to use a navigation more and more and you're going to unlearn all the freehand skills that you have generated or you have acquired over years and years of putting screws. I mean, yes, in a complex C7 T1 where there's an odd hemi and you can't really see anything. I mean, there anyways, you are blind and then, you know, this is like a boon. But then when you do it for every these case, is it, do you feel somewhere that after putting thousand cases that I don't know. But uh, I, I agree to that fact. But the thing is that as you grow older, you don't want stress. You also <laughs> understand that it's less stressful. And you know that you are past your screw, you are comfortable. You don't have to worry about that part of the surgery. When you're doing a complex deformity, Putting a screw is a part of it. Now, only the part of correcting the deformity is a stressful part. Therefore, it takes off the stress. Your surgery becomes much easier. You perform better when you are doing the crucial step. Having said that, navigation, when you get adopted, it might take you five to 10 minutes to do a navigation overall. It just might add 10 minutes for a navigation time. And probably when you're putting a lot of screws, it saves time if you plan it accurately. It doesn't add to the time. Initially, it does, but later it doesn't. But uh, Alok, you want to say something? Yes, Alok. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're, to your point um, that, well, first of all, as a surgeons, you should always adapt to the new skill set. So you should never be afraid of new technologies. It just gives you new capabilities. But then also it improves your efficiency. And so instead of doing one or two surgeries, let's say in a day, you can do four and five surgeries. You know, I, in my mind, a single level lumbar fusion should take one hour to do. In the US, the average time is three hours. So in that time, you can do two to three more surgeries with more reproducibility. So the robot, while, while you'll lose certain skills, you'll gain more efficiency and then that will increase your volume and productivity. That's how I think about it. That's why standardization is so critical in all this. Hi, Dr. Ajay Krishnan, you said that uh, you can even teach your juniors to start you know, learning their spine surgeries with the navigation and OAM. But I think the conventional teaching was first you should do 100 open surgeries, then you should shift to MIS so that you know you get that feel, you actually see the anatomy. Yeah. So how about it? Like uh, if they start learning it directly on a navigation and OAM. Uh, see, this is, see, critically what if we think if about Salesh asks, if there's a complication, what do you do? So you have to be trained in everything and you <laughs> have to, you should know how to mobilize all the workforce to deal with it. But yeah. at the same time, when the learning part is coming, what you have seen at our centers also, the juniors and the junior consultants, they are better into putting the navigation things than me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something so similar like... Uh, we, nowadays, some sub level and wires and books so yeah. all, are, all are gone to the pedicle screws. In yeah. future, it was if everybody has a navigation, like everybody is going to do navigation. No, no, but I'll tell you because I trained in an era when the intraoperative x rays was used for trauma. Bharat trained in that era, and people, when the CRM came, they were used to tell the same statement. Yes. You know, yeah. If you have an image intensifier, what if it breaks down? What will you do? Yeah. But it's all a changing environment changing technology, you have to adopt it. Yeah. The earlier you adopt, the better you are. Other you are lost in the game. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your excellent inputs. Uh, uh, Dr. Shetty, as crisp as always, and uh, uh, very precise uh, tips and tricks, I would like uh, to invite Dr. Ajay Krishnan with his experience on complexities. Uh, Dr. Krishnan is doing very complex cases, uh, and the team is doing phenomenal work. Over to you, Ajay. Try to make it a bit fast and quick. Yes. So uh, we'll sort out. Uh, we'll just specifically focus with uh, the technological advantages. Why it is being done? See, it's a completely different league. There are n number of questions. This is a Formula One track. 
you can enjoy it or you can truly criticize this but this is a completely different league what you are going to do once you have this uh, enabling technologies with you five years back there was not even a neuro monitoring what everybody was using and now we are practically using for say 50 to 70% of cases neuro monitoring it is needed so you realize the need when you find those advances so uh, unwinding and relearning is what is most important and uh, as complexity the first thing that comes into it is the deformity part and it may be for alignment so it can be for instability it can be for compressive decompression this is the three components which is part of any complex thing is there i'll put few cases across through uh, basically it is for projecting the direction getting the length and width accurate for the most strongest fixation which is the pedicle which is as of now our strength in uh, spine surgery and changed uh, the uh, bad part or the poor outcome giving spine surgeries to best part was fixation probably and this this one thing gets improved significantly by uh, going the oam way or say the navigation way so just going to cases to understand what we can achieve this is the neurofibromatosis case is a 15 year old female girl with this thin flimsy, flimsy uh, pedicles the bone is bad osteoporotic pathological bone completely altered uh, shapes and even directions of the pedicle you can see two vertebras completely translated also here you cannot achieve a reduction until unless you do a vcr that was the standard for me usually for doing all these cases to achieve the bone across anteriorly and create from normal bone to uh, uh, normal bone stud and still you end up failing in those cases in these cases you have tried like this is usually associated with uh, subluxations with kyphosis with acute angular deformities which is there this is the patient's clinical picture what you have so what you end up doing in this cases now is you have started putting more screws more screw densities which is there proximally as well as distally which was earlier also there like what i have done here is you are putting these screws which are anatomical screws and these screws are which are straight screws and the anatomical screws are connected across the junction to the opposite side and the same way the straight screws are connected this way so i have four rods that prevents the failure for these group of patients till i am getting the fusion so the most important thing which i have, i had in my all cases was that failures were frequent with the implant itself for neurofibromatosis so first is the strength so how do you achieve the strength of fixation by multiple fixation points and this needs precision say this direction how if it, does, it doesn't match you are not able to get the rods in so that's how i am able to get away with this uh, group of cases say this is a 125 degree kyphosis with myelopathy 26 year old female uh we are not discussing here why you did the case this is we are talking how we did the case and what were the added advantage which you got with this uh type of cases so it's not the case discussion probably which we are going to do with this uh, whole spectrum so this is again myelopathy we want we have to do a corrective surgery in this patient she is 26 year old we did a multi level fixation which was done proximal distal once it is done we are doing a vcr what was planned anteriorly we uh, reached out Uh, after the fixation was done and once we did the ventral part this is the cord which is exposed this is the ventral part we had exposed after having put the screws we lost the signal once we reached the ventral to the body we are not decompressed anything to the around the cord so at that point of time so what would be the reason why i would lose the signal so i just got a ct scan then see we didn't plan for any navigation here so we did a ct scan here and we found that there was a screw which was there which immediately didn't come on to the uh, uh, neuro monitoring so that was giving a late uh, 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 deterioration which was noted so we changed the screw because of that uh, 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 finding which would be could confirm on ct scan and then we changed it to and finally the patient came out good also and we corrected it also so an intraoperative uh, doubt what you have can always be corrected with a ct scan which you achieve so you don't have to get ct scan in all patients or say you don't have to do navigation in all the cases you are good at putting this through you don't have to use all the aspects of the navigation or the uh, ct based technique for each case you can use it partly for your advantage and win over the case 
say these are the minimal invasive cases which probably would be the future of the degenerative scoliosis and even maybe an ais cases in these cases if you put an incision and direct your screws you may miss out so projecting the direction from the skin itself is possible by a, a navigated method so this allows precise position of the skin incision and that projection is very much useful for any of the mis techniques that is the best advantage what you have with any of this uh, 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 navigation based techniques now this is another case he was a uh, complete paraplegia placid asian 36 year old male since a month this was the shumans the small disc bulges which was there cord edema was there over the segment of the cord so i ended up doing a, uh, a shortening procedure with uh, corpectomy and this is what had been done this all was clinical but i got a per operative ct scan to confirm the accuracy of each and every screw why because he is a young patient 36 year old if he doesn't recover a paraplegy he is going to roam around and for a small breach also i am going to be questioned and this is the medical legal aspect what you are going to face this patient recovered significantly and he is a normal walker without anything left now so the surgery remains the conventional one but the added advantage was my stress free things so there is there is nothing i have to uh, bear as a consequence of a misplaced screw medial or lateral or whatever you say so it helps in confirmation so he is a normal walker now this is a case this is a 79 year old male patient cirrhotic patient operated as for elsewhere with multilateral fixation presented with a backache now aggravated mechanical pain uh, leg pain you go in through to diagnose that there is an infection which is there and which is going on here and what you have to do in this group of patients is a ileo lumbar fixation so clinically you used to put the lumbar uh, the, the 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 pelvic fixations now you are able to do it with a navigated so navigated screws if you can I, 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 you can put two screws into the ileum so s2 ai screws you are able to put even two screws easily so that gives you added leverage say putting one screw clinically was okay say putting two screws you are having additional leverage as long screws it is possible so how you are able to uh, uh, cross those barriers in this patient you also use bone graft because i used both the iliac crest to have good bone graft bed at the same time i had used infuse in this patient i have used the calcium sulfate uh, say stimulant with the antibiotic uh, impregnation for delivery of the local antibiotic with all this done this is the incision was is there you have put this is the main incision this is the bone so even with the iliac crest bone graft massive you have harvested bilaterally you are able to put s2ai screws so i mean that is the added advantages you have these are Results are awaited. We are talking about the technology, the technique. So this is again the upper dorsal kyphosis, which I usually used to correct earlier, do a VCR corrections, balance the spine out. But for upper dorsal, I have stopped doing anything aggressive. I have started doing more of gibectomies. I have started more of decompressive surgeries because these patients don't come to you for a deformity, but for a myelopathy usually. And my focus is myelopathy. Uh, what I need to relieve. So this was. or one of the patient so this is possible with short segment fixation also a bilateral decompression you can do this is only possible when you can precisely decompress it and that is possible navigated because you are able to exactly locate where you want to put i use mesonic as the uh, third party registration see this is mesonic which is used so you can actually uh, do sculpting of the bone which you want to cut so least amount of bone you have removed you have more amount of bed you have left so this is the gibbous part which is there you are removing a trough of bone inside ventrally then this is the slab which is created what you do is a vertically placed cut beside the cord you are able to put with mesonics bone scalpel as third party registration and then you push the slab down so i have this much amount of bone which is left here i have this all bone which is left here and this is a bed for fusion which we can which i can put and you are able to get away with short fixations short surgery and this is already got published now so this is the way to get over so teaching as a, as we talked and discussed teaching is easier with navigation uh, youngsters would be able to reproduce it better than even us probably they may not be able to achieve that conventional open surgical confidence but at the same time if they get supervised we have the best of both worlds together what saran very uh, clearly mentioned 
angular annotations you can do with the oam you can do stitching of the images what is there so this is an ais which is there uh, there is a upper curve there is a lower curve but it was not much significant on the lower side it is the upper one which is flexible and a hump for which we were doing a surgery the pedicles were small so in this all case all these tools i had put navigated and after having put everything corrected everything you have stitched the images and with the stitched images you are able to uh, 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 see and correct the uh, alignment and you are able to see uh, the, with the intercostal lines you are able to compare the things also and you can see the preciseness of this screw what you are able to place say this is a small uh, pedicle which you are having and you are able to place it accurately so here is what the utility of it comes and the stitched image and the perioperative things of getting a long cassette and imaging and then making those uh, predictions and uh, not having that whole length uh, film that all goes here so this is what you can achieve with this so for osteotomy this is specifically important uh, what uh, uh, ajay shetty said also uh, conveyed so it is the limited visibility of the anatomy which is there the heavy bleeding and you cannot retract the dorsal cord or the cervical cord and you cannot you have to confirm that whether the intra vertebral work or the wedge you have created whether it is complete or not so the tools which you can use is the navigated stealth midas or a third party navigated say uh, ultrasonic bone scalpel so that helps you to uh, ex exactly locate where you are cutting through for angst bond for psos for wedge osteotomies you can very well do this you can uh, precisely plan and it is in of immense help this is one of the cases which i have just done two days back a, 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 a an angular kyphosis which is there this is a congenital vertebra which is there and additionally there is a small another uh, 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 wedge vertebra which is there these are two vertebras and the patient has a disco vertebral osteomyelitis at this level so the patient actually presented as a non walker with walking difficulties and radicular pains which was there and this was flexible to this level and this is what was the disease like this and what you ended up doing is putting free hand screws and with the free hand screws which was done the pedicle screw simulator triggered emg say you are using the intraoperative neuromonitoring to confirm the positions of the screw and my better partner ravi ranjan was checking each of those screws to make it sure that screws were very correct and we had all these screws put six above six below all correct it was fine but my clinical field said that the screw which was going through the wedge vertebra had some doubt with me on my clinical field in spite of the ionom saying that there was all fine so at that point i could get a navigation in and in that navigation i could see that it is just reaching the medial wall here so at this point of time i had used all screws which was 7 mm screws had i put a 7 mm screw here i would have definitely caused a problem here so when you are relying on multiple inputs you are able to precisely find the problem which can be there and i could redirect this by navigation so for this one screw i could use the navigation and i could redirect it easily all other screws are placed they are all they were all correct so this is and at that particular screws i had used 5 mm screws other thing in the same case what you ended up doing is that this is a registered registered probe which you are placing at the upper uh, part of the spinous process we are planning to put the cut so that gives you the projection of the wedge with the hinge at the anterior vertebral body margin and this is exactly nearly the 45 degree which you can plan the correction and it is exactly giving me the point at which i have to put the next cut posteriorly so this length of my cutting is already pre decided before the surgery so that way it helps in planning my wedge of resection in a wedge resection so a 45 degree correction i could do that is one thing which is possible secondly is that when you are using the probe you can use this probe for seeing the adequacy of the completion of the intra vertebral work say so this is a virtual this is a virtual image there the part of the bone this this vertebral wedge and this part of the bone you have already removed but because it is a pre op pre acquired image already you will be seeing the bone there but the peel and the tip tells me that the wedge anterior part is there because it is a closing wedge osteotomy i want a hinge there i don't want to complete through the anterior part and create a completely loose uh, opening which may open up the cord which i don't want so that's how you overcome uh, uh, in this group of patients and 
this is very much important in cervical patients because in cervical patients you are not able to see which is, what is happening ventrally and you don't want to breach anterior for osteotomies which we are not doing much of surgeries for cervical deformities but those who are doing it would be of very big help so this is what we able to achieve a moderate correction and this was what was possible as we planned so this is an olive case with a percutaneous extent in lateral position the same position you are able to do the olive as well as the percutaneous extent position umesh was with us for this and he was the major doer in this case we are early beginners for uh, 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 for uh, uh, the uh, uh, anterior surgeries for fusion uh, so what we did is that put a percutaneous screw there in the lateral position and at the same time someone else is calculating the trajectory and the opening up procedure for the anterior and you have done the anterior for a lysthesis which was l4 pi so both the procedures could be simultaneously done with the same sitting so what you are achieving say it is the microscope mounted things which is going on further so this we have already placed the they guide wires there done the procedure microscopically anterior coming back again putting the screws so you are saving hell lot of time you are able to finish this olive in say matter of 1 to 1 and a half hours it is possible to finish and with experience it may get reduced significantly so even maybe around one hour so everything is so much helpful in if we use the enabling technologies so safe spine surgery is what is needed precision matters the errors of navigation and technology can be even bigger than what is the open surgery is what uh, uh, ajesh it is sir very well mentioned and 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 whether this precision ma matches with the clinical outcome that is something is an open question so we are talking here of precision and now we uh, uh, balancing it with an outcome that is something which we need to see in the future thank you thank you dr krishnan for a very uh, elaborative talk very nice and challenging cases and great work and great learning from uh, you to all of us uh, anyone would like to ask any question one thing just i would like to uh, uh, support what you were saying is a paraplegic patient when he comes to us and we operate it is always better to check it intraoperative because he is going to take definitely a uh, lot of opinions and you know he is always concerned that i am not getting better my legs are not moving and someone might say that this screw is looking medially and that that is where we have to be very careful in placement of the screws and oam will definitely help in a big way in such situations uh, rest all the deformity cases what you showed absolutely beautiful execution any uh, quick words from you alok and uh, ajoy i mean uh, ajay has shown a great uh, <clears throat> surgery and use of navigation and technology uh, you have to be extremely careful when you are doing a kyphosis screw insertion actually the screw mal position is much higher in kyphosis rather than in uh, scoliosis yes and uh, you you think always is the other way around but uh, scoliosis is one area where navigation kyphosis is one area where navigation really helps for kyphosis earlier what i used to do is put easy screws away from the apex but near the apex what you do is you do the job and then you are putting open screws that was the safest way which i was doing because a small error in the deformed spine creates big problem yeah yeah yes alok no i think it's a uh, krishna ajay this is amazing cases i mean i really appreciate at the end the efficiencies you're getting from doing the 360 fusion with a robot what do you think is going to be your next challenge or your next uh, your next step in improvement with uh, with this technology ajay i could not hear it can you please repeat it there was something with wrong with the audio okay no problem can you hear me now yeah yeah i can i can okay now i think that the cases you showed were incredible i mean it was really great use of the uh, technology and i appreciate the efficiencies you were able to get with the 360 fusion what do you think is going to be your next big challenge that you're going to overcome with the robot and navigation what's your next improvement the next thing what will come up further is definitely going the future is going to be robotic future is going to be robotic but to have the reproducible results so first is oam the next step is definitely going to be uh, robotics and as you said it will be artificial intelligence based database surgeries wherein you have everything fed and the uh, direct 
outcome what is shown by the computer is to be executed that is the only thing what is going to be future yes. except you are seeing that any quick comment from you guru actually when when i come to my talk we will see that whatever dr ajay and ajay krishnan they covered tip and tricks and tricks and whatever ajay could do it with his own hands we can increase the precision using the robot so you can make it much faster also because robot will position itself accurately at that point where we have to find the pedicle even if we are using navigation we have to find the pedicle with the pedicle finder but then with robot robot will directly position you accurately at that point so definitely we will be able to do it more precisely more accurately and more faster so when i come to my talk we will see that how how we can do that no thank you guru because it's always a dilemma when uh, sanjiti uh, management were planning to buy this uh, robot versus worm and uh, navigation then all these questions always creeped in you know they were thinking what is going to be the future and yet we, everyone is little skeptical but finally they bought the worm the o2 and uh, still but station the navigation, navigation plus robot yeah that is actually the best thing is worm plus robot yeah that yeah. is the ultimate yeah that's all awesome. worm is just a image <laughs> acquire worm is just a image acquire ultimately yes, yes. if we have to compare, have to compare yeah. with yeah. navigation yes bharat sir now we we are I'm not muted. able to I'm muted, sir you are muted I'm... muted dr bharat you are muted Bharat, Bharat, you are you're muted. muted. Sorry, the 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 cost is the main important aspect. I think the with the OAM and navigation, the cost you can cut it down to practically zero. While with the with the robot, it is not going to be. So yeah. so so, doctor, you know the the question from uh, our uh, Alok Sharan probably you know, that is something which we all should really consider the disposables. Yeah, yeah. That, that should be my next uh, you know question yeah. to the robotic surgery. Yes, correct. Yeah, over to you, Ajay. And Dr. Ajay Kota will be talking about the current concepts, and then we will have the robotic talk by Dr. Guru Raj. Yes, Ajay. I think uh, I thought it was very difficult to talk towards the end of the symposium, but I think I learned is talking after Dr. Ajay Krishnan is more difficult. So that was the first point. Uh, second important thing is I think uh, what Dr. Ajay Krishnan's talk. really motivated me because we are you know towards the beginning of our complex cases and i think a good surgical skill with technology i think it can give the best possible outcome to the patient despite the complexity and i think these complex cases when operated in non technological era led to more neuro deficits and it gave spine surgery a bad name but i think this is the best time with these advanced tools to really wipe off that stigma from spine surgery that you know paralysis ho jayega kya doctor which patient usually asks i think uh, excellent cases and i think what fascinated me the most doctor ajay was the last kid what you showed that you did a olive with percutaneous screw you know from the back and what two surgeries were necessary or you know maybe 3 to 4 hours surgical time was necessary you could uh, do it in 1 and 1/2 hours i think uh, it has really stimulated us and actually motivated us because we are going to start uh, using this uh, navigation and oam thanks dr ajay so when we start with uh, these complex cases once again so we see this complex 130 degree post tubercular kyphosis patient and this is actually the image that we see intraoperatively on an cm so this is the patient's mri image so when we had to operate this patient in you know at times where there is no navigation there is no oam i think uh, with just neuro monitoring at our hands as dr bharat dave rightly said that you know many heartbeats missed lot of you know your uh, colleagues coming into the play for helping you out in the surgery and uh, you end up you know spending more and more time in these complex deformities so when we talk about these complex deformities this is the times when we never used oams or when we never used our uh, uh, you know navigation systems we did these surgeries but uh, absolutely as rightly said we used to have lot of uh, heart beats missed and lot of anxious moments intraoperatively so that was how it is so when we talk of a c1 c2 instability so ct scan that we have it really gave us so much of idea about the complex 
neurovascular structures around and this is the mri image of that patient so we did the surgeries before oam before navigation but again as said just with the neuro monitoring which even was not uh, available you know when we did these surgeries so until and unless the patient moved his both upper limbs and lower limbs we used to be always you know having a lot of stress on our minds but i think with the advent of oam and neuro monitoring it's definitely going to help us in a big 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 way in high grade slips like this wherein we initially used to put screws at l2 we used to distract it and then try to lever out that l5 and then try putting screw at that level and then start distracting from one side doing interbody preparation from one side and do it vice versa again i think uh, oam is definitely going to add value in such cases wherein we need not go to a level higher and we can directly put a screw here start distracting it start doing our disc space preparation so this is one additional advantage i feel of oam and navigation over our conventional cases uh now talking about the literature uh, we are running short of time so i would not take much of time so comparison of intraoperative radiation exposure for oam intraoperatively versus cam image intensifier in minimally invasive lumbar fusion surgeries when i was going through the literature actually it said that you know the we introduce oam at our facility to allow use of precise navigation and despite two or more ct acquisitions per surgery the surgeons re was completely avoided and patients re was reduced to less than or half of that of cm which proves that oam is beneficial both for surgeon as well as patients in mis lumbar fusion surgery so that was the criticism that patient gets more and more of radiation but i think uh, that's also been overcome uh, intraoperative imaging and navigation for c1 c2 posterior fusion so it says that actual cervical spine instrumentation is challenging and utilization of image assisted navigation increases the accuracy and safety of screw placement and there are empty number of literature which is available in today's era supporting oam supporting navigation so i would avoid duplication of what the previous speakers have said and one point i would like to stress upon that this is going to be the future of spine surgery and for better patient outcomes and patient satisfaction and safe spine surgery that has been the motto of all the spine surgeons all across i think this is going to help us thank you very much very nicely summarized and uh, explained that this is possible without this advent of technology but if you have this technology you are mentally less stressed you don't miss much of heart beats as you miss right now and this is going to be the future because uh, we will definitely need as the complexity of cases everyone is getting is difficult and complex cases we are going to get better outcomes with this uh, for sure thank you ajay for excellent uh, talk and uh, over to you dr guru raj the robotic spine and we all discussed about the oam the uh, neuro monitoring and the navigation and we are coming to the end of today's advances with dr guru raj and let's see what the robot is talking about today so in between okay. yeah Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'll just start sharing my screen. One moment. What is the current status of uh, robotic uh, in uh, US, Alok? What is the current status of the robot? Yeah. Uh, you know the problem with the robot at, for spine surgery is the cost. It's close to one million dollars, and okay. so especially now it's very it's very challenging for. uh people to buy it the truth is that the robot is beneficial for marketing but it hasn't really been able to uh show in that much greater safety and outcomes to justify the cost okay let's see what guru raj's experience is yes yeah. uh can you see my screen shailesh yes 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 okay uh, now i'm just going to slide show. okay can you see now yeah perfect okay uh, so i'm just going to touch upon what is robot and uh, how robot is uh, basically different than uh, a navigation uh, we are not going to talk about uh, oam because uh, oam is mainly a uh, image uh, actually acquirer and then it uh, basically helps the navigation to basically register the images better way 
so we are going to compare basically navigation based surgery and robotic surgery how it is better or how it is different from uh, basically navigation and uh, at whatever we discussed till now uh, whatever dr ajay krishnan discussed we will be able to do most of the things with the robot also whatever we are able to do in the navigation and uh, tips and tricks almost remain the same like dr ajay shetty discussed uh, so let's see uh, what is it so we all know that with increased incidence of uh, instrumentation uh, there is a increased incidence of revision surgeries because of the complications of the instrumentation uh, so that is why we are discussing about navigation or uh, we are discussing about uh, oam to increase the basically accuracy and precision of surgery so what is robot a robot is a machine especially one programmable by computer capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically and robots can be guided by an external control device or the control can be embedded within i just put this cartoon here in this lockdown situation especially we all understood now especially in this lockdown that household chores are very complex so if we could have one of the robots like this the life can become very very simple so with the evolution of the robotics robotics have become more capable they have become more efficient they have become more reactive there is lot of flexibility now and they have become more precise and accurate so when it comes to spine surgery what we are looking it is mainly the precision and the accuracy often we get confused precision to the accuracy and let's see what is accuracy and precision precision is the ability of the robot to bring its end effector to the same position and orientation over and over again so every time the end effector should be able to come to the same position again and again that is precision what is accurate accuracy is the ability of the robot to move its end effector to a desired position and orientation that has never been attained before if we talk in terms of pedicle accuracy is putting a pedicle screw exactly into the bony basically bony conveniences without breaching any of the borders so that is accuracy so what are the advantages Adv robots are actually increasingly assisting in sensitive surgeries like doing osteotomies doing pedicle screws and it has been found that robots are almost 10 times more precise as compared to human surgeons and robot can move with the accurate of 1 micron basically so robot is very accurate and what are the added advantages in spine surgery that is accuracy decreasing the radiation exposure to the surgeon decreasing the complication rates with time the operative time decreases and with usage of the minimally invasive spine surgeries recovery time also decreases but then the what are the disadvantages that is the cost like dr alok was mentioning the investment cost and there are recurrent costs also for robotic spine surgery like dr bharat was saying uh, for a oam with navigation the recurrent cost is much lesser but then in the robotic spine each and every patient the consumable itself cost a significant amount of uh, money and then there is some amount of learning curve for it uh, because if you don't familiarize with your instruments or with the gadgets you have you might end up doing more harm than better so there is some learning curve to it to familiarize with your uh, gadget so coming to the advantages of robot over the again navigation it eliminates mainly hand tremors or a surgeon uh, oriented uh, errors and it reduces surgeon fatigue even you are doing a long surgeries basically the errors which happen due to the surgeon fatigue that can be reduced it decreases the incision size because it exactly positions itself at the point where you are going to start your pedicle screw fixation so actually you can during the planning process you can measure where you can put a incision on the skin so it, it decreases the incision size and then this is very important robot has a 7 degree of freedom of motion so like dr shailesh was telling in his uh, initial talk that we can human hand has limitation it can move only in flexion extension or maybe maximum rotation but then robot has a 7 degree 
freedom of motion so there are three types of robots available right now that is supervisory control robots that is the plan of the operation is entirely done pre operatively and the robot performs the complete surgery in the supervision of the surgeon with the supervision of the surgeon so this has been tried in some of the basically eye surgeries and tele surgical the best example is da vinci robot where the surgeon directly controls the robot with the remote location and then the third kind is a shared control which is most of the available spinal robots now which are they are all shared control kind of robots where robot and surgeon both control the instruments simultaneously so coming to the robots basically the first robot which came into the market was a mesor spine assist the mesor company from israel so it was fda approved in 2004 it had a 6 degree of freedom of motion and the main problem of this kind of robot was a skiving and it didn't have a sensor for a when patient moved it didn't prompt you that patient has moved so it had a higher degree of error and then they came up with a, the basically second generation robot that is major renaissance that got fda approved in 2011 so by basically that is a upgraded version of the basically a major spine assist it had upgraded algorithms and basically it also had a feasibility that surgeon could flatten the bone surface where the screw entry point was there this is very important when it comes to robots because to prevent the skiving what do we mean by skiving skiving is your basically drill bit can slip on the oblique sliding surfaces and move not on the desired path so to prevent that you have to eat some of the bone there and then again major renaissance didn't have a motion sensors now the most advanced uh, robot which is available which got fda approval in 2018 that is major x with the stealth edition basically they, what they have done here is uh, they have combined robot with the their asset stealth edition navigation so now this is a ultimate combination of a robot itself with the navigation where you have a robotic basically robot uh, base for performing basically guiding you into screw insertion and you can also have a visual feedback feedback from the navigation and it also had a motion detector whenever a patient moved it will prompt you and if patient moves basically the robot itself adjusts itself to the new position so because of that most of the errors which were there in the previous robots were obviated by using a major x this is the one which we have at our institute now so let's see how to proceed with these so that is the major x stealth edition that is from the metronics so this has got a navigation uh, basically and then this is a robotic arm which is fixed to the basically you fix to your table and uh, then you have this uh, same kind of robotic arm from globus that is called excelius gps but then this in this the robotic arm is not montable onto the table it is mounted separately onto a uh, basically stand of its own and then again it is basically combined with the navigation there is another company which has come up with the same kind of robotic arm that is rosa one spine system by zimmer biomet so we'll just see what is the, the between uh, navigation to robots and a free hand technique so most of we know the good planning is almost like a half surgery done so when it comes to planning so free hand we always did a planning on image based whether it be a x ray or whether it be a ct or whether it be a mri but then when it came to navigation you could have done the planning based on the pre operative ct or image acquired during the surgery intra operatively by using oam but then the planning had to be done basically once you basic basically reintegrate the images basically by registering the images but then in uh, robotics it is basically mainly based on artificial intelligence artificial intelligence so planning can take place in true ap lateral and axial you can plan accuracy 
what a how maximum possible accuracy and planning can be done and execution is complete to up to the robot so here basically the error of mismatch between planning to execution is basically taken away by using the robot that there can be when you use a navigation there can be a basically error of execution so that can be obviated by using the robot so in coming to planning so there is basically in mesor uh, x it is basically based on the artificial intelligence and it is dynamic and it allows more than just screw trajectory planning basically this software allows you to plan osteotomy interbody case placement it also allows you to plan a deformity correction in a simulation model and basically to achieve a perfect sagittal balance parameters pi to ll uh, matching that helps in patient sagittal balance and it also helps in tulip head alignment and it gives pre operatively in your cabin you can perfectly plan the rod alignment also how much the rod has to be bent all that can be planned pre operatively before you enter into the operation theater so what i was telling is this if you if you want to plan your rod alignment especially when you are doing a minimally invasive surgery minimal access surgery and you are using a, a large number of screws so negotiating a screw if you have not planned your screws properly negotiating a rod through them is going to be really difficult when if you try to tighten the hinges you are one of some of the screws can pull out so you can actually plan the rod alignment if you see here i have planned these two screws in a different way so how you how it will show it will actually show you this that your rod has to be bent like this if you have planned your screws like that if you don't want to bend it to that much of lordosis or you have to drive this screw more in inner or you have to plan in such a way that this screw stays out more prouder so this gives a perfect planning before you get into the operation theater again similar way if you are if you have planned your screws from more lateral to medial then you have to bend your rod like this that becomes really difficult when it comes to especially minimally invasive surgery so you have to plan your screws in such a way that if you are able to put a straighter rod then this is another thing here when you plan you can actually roll completely through the pedicle and see that you are whatever diameter screw you have planned it really is going through and through the pedicle in, into the all the borders without violating any of the borders but then if you have violated any border like that you can always plan back your screw and then robot will execute it perfectly to the accuracy so that is a bigger advantage when you plan this with the robotic software again the same you can plan your screw sagittally again so you can scan your screw through and through from the tulip head to the end whether you are through and through into the bone so next the other thing you can plan is if you see here you you are just breaching a medial wall of your pedicle there so you pre operatively you plan your screws properly so that you avoid any medial breaches and then you can plan your screw diameters here you can see we have planned 7.5 mm screws you can use 8.5 mm screws also and then if you see here the angulation is almost 35 degrees so if you have to plan this kind of a uh, screw in navigation you will come to know only in the intraoperative period and especially when it comes to s1 screws where your iliac crest can overhang on the uh, basically the pedicle entry points so you won't be able to medialize so much so with the robotic planning what you can achieve is you can plan it with bit it bit more straighter or you can use this same angle if it your iliac crest allows how we can do this is by doing this it really gives you the projection of your tools which are going to come in or from where you are going to start on the skin you can measure from the center how much laterally you have to start exactly where you have to start drilling or where you have to take your skin incision so as i was mentioning this really helps in decreasing the skin incision and in especially in s1 screws whether if your ilex 
crest is coming in between you can plan this cruise in a better way pre operatively before you enter into the operation theater then coming to registration uh, free hand it really doesn't apply but when it comes to navigation it the registration is based mainly based on futures it compares the uh, basically point to point system but what happens is if there is a change in the anomaly from the pre operative ct scan to a post op uh, in a pre op uh, pre operative positioning or a intra operative positioning the registration goes they were won't be able to basically register or a match images and then it creates errors it can be basically obviated by using oams but then still if you have a dislocation or if you do a inter body work before you put start putting your screw if you have registered it before then again it uh, creates errors but then in robotics because it is a uh, ai based registration and it registers each vertebra separately it registers l4 separately and l5 separately but in navigation it doesn't happen it re registers basically uh, a column as a whole but then if you want to register separately then you have to register each and individual vertebra manually separately but then in robotic spine in major x each and single vertebra is registered separately automatically because it identifies the end plates it identifies the pedicles it identifies the disc so that way the your registration process is much faster and much simpler so the registration technique in robot it has got two that is one is electromechanical registration and then another one is optical so there is a basically two types of registration but when it comes to navigation it's only the optical registration and it is always found that the electromechanical registration is considered more accurate as compared to navigation based optical registration so it is the electromechanical registration is more accurate as compared to navigation so this is how it registers the vertebras uh if you see that uh, this video is not running basically it flips between the uh, ct based ct image and a Im image taken intraoperatively and then it registers each vertebra separately it is stuck because it was a video we are going to go to the next slide because we are running yeah no i am going to next slide it's not moving there it's so okay one, yeah. i'll i'll just start sharing it again from the next slide yeah uh, yeah sorry so maybe to rush yeah. a little yeah yeah i'm just maybe quick cases guru and yeah 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 that's on there it's not moving it's not moving one minute sorry you can jump the slide and go to yeah the... yeah that that is what i'm trying it's not happening there i'll just come back to you. meanwhile if you have questions just yeah uh, i think uh, it was a very uh, good uh, presentation by dr guru raj about the usefulness about uh, of uh, the robot and uh, the navigation uh, all summarizing you know okay, these are the things which are going to be the future they are going to be very useful for complex things as well as trauma tumor deformity and it is going to be soon the future uh, as alok was talking about there are eight theaters and eight of them have oam and navigation in uh, the us in the hospital which he was mentioning i just would like uh, bharat sir to quickly comment about the scenario yeah i think uh, the artificial intelligence is the way ahead i'm sure everybody on this platform would agree to the same i think the abilities of person like ajay krishnan and probably you know many of you who have the 3d vision are going to be enhanced by this artificial intelligence and the technology which we have adopted in our uh, in our sort of surgical um, i would say surgical uh, uh, temple you can say that and i think the inabilities you know there are 
people who probably are not able to do certain things, but then will be able to do with the artificial intelligence as well. So at the end of the day, all in all, I think we will end up having this and there is no other sort of second thought about it. But at the same time, I would just warn that before sort of accepting and before sort of ordering, make sure that we all prepare the inventory of this because inventory could be completely different and it will add on the cost. So just a warning sign, yes, everything looks pretty lucrative, excellent cases, but they are not that common cases as well. So when you look at the common scenarios for the common orthopedic surgeon, common spine surgeon, common surgical techniques, yes, you do not need this, but in certain cases, this is the way ahead as well. Thank you. So Shailesh, I'll just rush through my presentation. Yeah, uh, Guru, if you can, yeah, Guru, yes, you can, you can just show quickly a case or two because yeah, we are rushing yeah. for the time. So, we are getting constant call. Yeah. yeah, basically this we all discussed uh, and execution. Basically, what we were talking uh, when it comes to navigation, still we have to find the pedicles. Still we have to find that trajectory, and that takes some time. But then when it comes to robot, it directly positions itself there, so it that fiddle factor is uh, lessened there. And then accuracy, we all have discussed, it's more than almost up to the 99%. And uh, basically this, this what was we were stressing, like Dr. Bharat was also stressing, that you need to actually basically familiarize with your uh, gadgets. Uh, so with the experience, your uh, accuracy will go up. So don't get frustrated initial period when you, you, you find that it is going to increase your time, operative time or maybe one or screw goes here and there. This is all a uh, part of the learning curve. And then again, uh, this is with the reduction of uh, basically radiation evidence. Again, it reduces the screw malposition. This is another very important factor that it reduces the adjacent segment degeneration by planning properly by decreasing the proximal facet violations. That is very important when it comes to lumbar spine. Um, again, the cost basically, this is a US study. Alok might be able to comment better. So they say that based because they have converted most of those uh, cases from open to minimal invasive with the help of the robot. So the cost has actually gone down. It really doesn't uh, more translate into uh, basically uh, expensive gadget. And then accuracy again, this is when another one important factor when we use this navigation or a robot that you will be able to do biopsies which are hard to reach the regions from the regions where initially which was not possible or do a accurate vertebroplasties or to do a uh, accurate kyphoplasties in hemangiomas and uh, fractures. So this is case one. This was our first case, which was an open, simple listesis case. This was done as a first case for with our robot. So this simple uh, with uh, basically a... a this, this, this is how it was executed. And actually, when you start using this, your initial few cases, the, definitely the time is going to be more. But once your team and yourself basically get familiarized with the robot, the time decreases. You take only maximum of six to 10 minutes putting four screws once you get familiarized with your basically a robot. So that's another case. Uh, so this is an osteoporotic fracture. So we did a cement augmented pedicle through fixation using the robot. And uh, this is a scoliosis, uh, lumbar scoli. Again, this was done using the robot. And this is a very interesting case, which was uh, already operated with the T3, T4 pot spine. And she got a secondarily infected. They had to remove the implants. And then she came back to us with this kind of a deformity. Uh, where the cervicothoracic deformity very gross, grotesque cervicothoracic deformity with paraparesis. So what we did was initially we put her on halo gravity action, tried to correct it a bit, and then uh, did a basically first stage. We did just a corpectomy and fixed temporarily using the robot into C7 and D1 pedicles and T4, T5 pedicles. And then again, basically, kept the kidneys loose and uh, distracted her on halopelvic traction and put uh, basically a cervical pedicles using a robot. 
and then this is another case a gross kyphoscoliotic deformity congenital one 13 year old child uh, so again we used a robot uh, with the meticulous planning here so this was what we could get the screws and all were fine but only thing is we couldn't correct the kyphosis too much because the signal started disappearing whenever we corrected more than this so we had to accept whatever we could get it safely so what is the potential basically it is uh, with using of the artificial intelligence the robot can identify the anatomy properly and plan instrumentation by itself now we are planning the instrumentation with the artificial intelligence in future once you just feed in the images ct images it can plan the instrumentation by itself and uh, basically they are planning to integrate try to integrate mri images because ct is lot of radiation even though we see we decrease the radiation but the cumulative radiation for the patient with oam or with the robotic is more as compared to the conventional surgeries so they are trying to integrate mri with the robotic uh, artificial intelligence so that they can decrease the radiation exposure to the patient and they are trying to construct a uh, basically a uh, machine to execute the rod bending you plan yeah. it rod count automatically blend bends itself and comes back to you and integration of robot with the ionm and drills and all that so the next era is going to be maybe like a thanos arm just click of your uh, finger uh, integration of a 5g technology with the artificial intelligence like alok was showing you can do a remote uh, basically surgeries with much faster and much accuracy so current limitation is basically the skiving is a major problem with the robot mri data is not yet integrated into it definitely recurring cost is one of the major limitations for us what we are using in our institution like dr bharat is using in every case um, oam and navigation the robot we cannot use it in every case because of the cost implications and uh, basically it is only used for right now for the screw uh, guidance but maybe robot can completely guide you doing osteotomies completely guide you doing laminectomies so that is possible in future so robot is definitely these technologies are revolutioning spine surgery definitely they will optimize the recovery if they increase the precision and accuracy and eventually help surgeon to focus on core work like maybe decompression thank you thank you guru for uh, a very good message and a uh, lot of uh, understanding about robotic surgery and the future uh, as we have all understood that it is a great boon the advantage of uh, robot is very very accurate placement of the screw and uh, in difficult situations it can be really uh, really a very uh, great help to us the uh, right now learning is uh, comparatively limited for robot is that intraoperative scanning is one thing probably they will be adding in so uh, in near future for the next generation which can be utilized with oam uh, in certain scenarios so it's all combination of this technology which is really useful i really thank the uh, faculty for giving excellent time and presentations especially dr bharat dave dr ajoy shetty dr alok sharan dr guru raj dr ajay krishnan dr ajay kothari and dr siddharth ayer at the same time i would like to thank uh, ortho tv dr ashok sham for a great support for these kind of advances and uh, which is uh, premiering all over the country and worldwide at the same time i would like to thank dr parak sanjiti for the initiative and uh, a thought behind the advances in our region for Uh, the oam and navigated surgeries thank you everyone for giving your time and looking forward for meeting uh, soon in future stay safe thank you all thank you shailesh thank you sanchiti thank hospital you. thank you thank, thank you, you ashok everybody. especially ashok thank is you. i think is the busiest person now <laughs> thank you thank you sir bye 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 thank you everybody bye thank you thank you bye bye thank you stay safe thank you thank you Hey man, you can stop the streaming.